as I'm sure many of us can relate to, no shortage of drama for the Phoenix Suns this holiday season. On today's episode of Locked On Suns, we'll talk about DeAndre Ayton's comments, Monty Williams' comments after a loss to the Knicks, and a new report on Suns' ownership and how that changes the rest of the season. Let's go. Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons and a writer at Suns.com and Dime Magazine. Thank you all for making Locked On Suns your first Listen here on this Suns game day. 71-point Donovan Mitchell is hosting the Phoenix Suns tonight. But we have a lot to get to before game day. So wherever you're finding the show, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, hit follow or subscribe. We're here for you every Monday through Friday to get you caught up, updated, refreshed with your favorite NBA team. You can also follow along at Locked On PHX Suns on Twitter to keep up with the latest shows, chat Suns with me, and get, again, up to date with all of it. The Suns lost a bad one on Monday, matinee game in New York City after spending New Year's Eve there. Don't know if those are connected, but either way, the, the, the loss was pretty unexcusable just the way that it, the way that it all played out, basically, and fouling so much on mid-range shots, getting out-hustled, getting out-competed, and, I mean, 31 points in the first half. It's kind of all you need to know. Um, And it was another loss in a row for the Suns, their third in a row, and another one right after the Raptors' loss on Friday evening that just had a a lot of miscues and a lot of, you know, competitive failures that just get to a point where you got to look at it and say it's unexcusable. Losses are fine. Losses happen. We knew there was going to be a lot of them without Booker in the lineup, but just a lack of of competitive spirit isn't. And so DeAndre Ayton spoke to that after the game. And to me, his comments, um, really, if we're circling back to mid-December, there was another stretch of games where we were hearing similar comments, but they're starting to stack up. They're starting to add up, and I it feels like we're hitting, I don't want to say a breaking point, but it's a signal to me when you hear the comments that sound so similar so many times over the course of a season that something's not going right. And so I want to read a little bit of what was said by Aiton and then by Monty, and then uh, I'll, I'll give you my, my deeper thoughts. But Aiton said... Teams are trying to take advantage of us to just hit first, but we can embrace the hit and hit back. That's what I'm used to. That's the things that we do. It's uh, the course throughout the game. We have to keep going for it. We have to just learn to sustain momentum, especially when we're on the road. He said, we have to make shots, but we can't get down when we're not. And the rhythm of our offense, because at the end of the day, we have to go back on the other end and play defense. And I think that's what's slowing us down a little bit. We're worried a little too much. We're worried about the score or us not making a shot. It's with our effort. So that's about it. We just got to stay stationary and lock in like how we used to lock in. All right. So like how we used to lock in. I mean, keep that lock in to that. Okay. Uh, He went on to say, this is all from Dwayne Rankin of the Arizona Republic, who does awesome work covering this team on the road when I'm not able to be in the building and and no one else is really on the Suns beat. He uh, Aiton went on to say, I don't even know what's going on. For me, I could tell you this. I'm not used to the no fight in us. I'm used to us being down 100 and we still are going to pull out and win the game or we still have that mentality like we're about to win this game. Right now, we don't have that. So that's the only thing that's going on throughout these games and why we're losing. We just got to really lock in and fight. We can't be thinking that somebody's going to feel sorry for us or thinking somebody's going to save us. Nobody is going to to save us. All right. So the things that, that I, again, really jump out to me are the, we just have to lock in like how we used to lock in. 
And he said, we can't be thinking that somebody's going to feel sorry for us or thinking somebody is going to save us. Now, I did a show, I think it was December 16th. I can look at what game that might have come after here as I'm talking, but it's been a through line, right? I did a show with Aaron Edwards about why no one's afraid of the Suns anymore. I did that episode. It was related to, I, I think I called it humble pie um, when when the Suns had lost a few ugly ones in a row. And I kind of stand by that. I, I think that it. I, my point back then was this team needs to be honest with itself about where it is. And I mentioned that when I hear the same things over and over, it's a problem. Or I start to raise my eyebrows and, and explore what that problem might be. That's true. But it, that doesn't change the fact that I think if you're in that situation, if you're in that locker room, you just have to approach it with humility. This team is being hunted. This team is not inspiring fear in any opponent that they play. I mean, the Knicks have been a very streaky team. They're they're definitely not pushovers, especially now that they've started to change their rotation and the young guys are playing and they're, you know, they're really helping the team. But it's not a, you know, that's not a a game you walk into if you're the Suns expecting to lose. You probably think you can win that one. They got beaten by a Raptors team that's been incredibly disappointing during uh, the month of December. The Wizards blew them out by 25, you know? So you have to be able to confront the realities of all of that if you're going to have any hope of changing it. Um, So that brings us to what Monty said, which was it's a mind-boggling thing, just the nature of losing this way. But it's happening too many times with this team. And then he said later, mentally and emotionally, I've got to get our guys stronger. Now, I've seen some Suns fans starting to wonder about Monty's um, job security. I can promise you James Jones is not going to be the one to fire Monty Williams. We're gonna we're just about to get into some of the ownership and leadership drama with this team. There's already too much uncertainty that anybody is getting fired before the end of the season. I just I don't really see what that would accomplish. I don't see what would possibly get bad enough that that you would make such a big change. And I will remind everybody that all of these guys, Jones and Monty, they are they just both recently got contract extensions. But Monty keeps referring to the 2019 to 20, uh, 20 problems when the Suns lost 17 of 21 games, including a seven game losing an eight game losing streak in there. And then they went on to respond to that stretch by winning seven of their next 11. That was when they really started to turn a corner. If you remember, that's when McHale went into the starting lineup for the very first time in his career. DeAndre Ayton had a couple monster performances. And Monty's referring to that as like an indication that the program, the culture can withstand a bad slump. Right now, the Suns have lost 11 of 15. They would have to lose their next six in a row to match that 2019-20 slump, right? But there was obviously, there is obviously much more writing on this season than that season. So the situations aren't exactly comparable. And when I read that Aiton quote, I don't think much about, you know, the way they played back when nobody had any expectations and Kelly Oubre was playing 35 minutes a night. I think back to the Mavericks series, right? So again, we let, we need to lock in like we used to lock in, um, At the end of the day, that's what's slowing us down is we're worried a little bit too much. We're worried about the score or us not making a shot. I'm used to us being down 100 and we're still going to pull it out. Like the mentality that we're going to win this game. Right now, we don't have that. It sounds a lot like what we heard after the collapses in game five and seven of the MAV series. Letting, uh, sorry, games six and seven of the MAV series. Letting mistakes compound mentally, you know, not being able to string runs together and all of that, you know, affecting effort at the end of the day. When you're in your own head, you're glancing at the scoreboard, you're hearing the crowd, you're you're getting, you know, you're feeling the energy of your opponent start to de- uh, develop and build. That's what I hear in Aiton's quotes. And unless Booker's out there, it just does not feel like this team believes in itself right now. You know, I went in on them after the the Wizards loss about the competitive spirit and it it has not gotten better since then. They've lost uh both games since and 
look, the belief, the, the, the spirit, all that stuff, that's just as big of a problem as the injuries are right now and just as big of a reason to make a trade sooner rather than later. So yes, they need to be honest with themselves. I don't think it's the fact that they're saying it. I think it's the fact that they're not changing it. That is uh, so worrisome to me. I don't think anybody's getting fired. I don't know if there's anything you can do but just keep going out there, rolling the ball out. And you hope that it is like 2019-20 and they win, you know, a few straight to make up for this. But again, it's just as that that mentality is just as big of a problem as anything. Probably means that they should be even more uh, hurried, pressured to make a change. But we don't know if that will be possible. New report from Brian Windhorst makes us question quite a bit what's actually going to be on the table in terms of trades for the Phoenix Suns this season. We'll dive into that next first today's show. Brought to you by Bet Online. Look, Bet Online is the number one place to go for all of your sports betting needs. That includes <clears throat> analysis, that includes news, that includes stats, everything you need to get informed. We have the national championship game coming up in college football. We have the pro football playoffs coming up in the not-too-distant future. Club soccer is back in full swing, plus men's and women's college basketball, and of course, pro basketball, which we all love. The Suns do not have odds up for their uh, Wednesday night game against the Cleveland Cavaliers, but you can bet on Sixers Pacers. Pacers are only 7.5 point underdogs. I'm not sure if people are out for that game, but that is an interesting line. The Bulls are four and a half point underdogs to the Brooklyn Nets, who have been playing very, very well, but the Bulls have been playing better lately too. So NBA regular season odds and much more, the fastest and easiest way to get your sports betting info. Head to the website today, that's betonline.net, or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Brian Windhorst of ESPN in his weekly column this week gave us a little bit of clarity about the Suns' ownership situation. I just don't know if it was the type of clarity that Suns fans actually want right now. But I'll give you my three keys from his report. Uh, You could easily go read it. I think it's uh, a free article. I don't think it's behind their paywall, but... You know how to find it. We are all uh, technologically savvy, but I'll give you my takeaways, the stuff that really matters. It's not expected Ishbia will be through the vetting process before the February 9th trade deadline. That's number one. That is a big bummer. That is basically the thing that's setting forth the rest of the drama here that, that Windhorse is reporting on. Apparently, number two, my key takeaway was that apparently Sarver still has to give personal sign-off on any deal for a player with a salary that is more than the current average player salary in the NBA, which this season is $10.8 million, which is just a little bit more than what Jay Crowder is making. So you talk about Kyle Kuzma, you talk about Eric Gordon, you talk about whoever, Harrison Barnes, all of those are players that make more than $10.8 million, all right? And I think the third thing is that salary cap repercussions seem to heavily factor into the repercu- to the to the reasoning for any of this, all right? And so I think the next logical thing to ask is why did that loophole get added? We heard about this uh, a couple of weeks ago before Ishbia's purchase was announced. There was that report from Baxter Holmes where he went through a lot of the long time Uh, business side staff who had helped create this environment that were still there, that did not get banned when Sarver did, when he got suspended, like President Jason Rowley, General Counsel Melissa Goldenberg, Kyle Pottinger, I think, uh, was one. Um, I don't want to throw people under the bus, but I believe those were the three names. And so that all kind of made sense. It's like, don't change too much about this business while I'm still running it type of thing. It was a little questionable why the NBA would grant him that, but to some extent it made sense. There's also some related to like, you can't move the team out of Arizona. All right. That makes sense too. But this one makes a little bit less sense in terms of why it is still in place, but I I do have a good read. I, I don't think it's crazy that it was there in the first place 
when Sarver stepped away from the team for his suspension and, you know, eventually put the team up for sale. I would say the number one reason why this was put into place, this sign-off mechanism, is that Sarver didn't know how long the sale would take. If you remember, uh, there was reporting from ESPN that Jim Pittman, the COO of the team, had told staff that it was going to take anywhere from six to nine months from the end of September when Sarver originally put the team up for sale for a buyer to be selected. And then, you know, the uh, uh, acceptance and approval process and all that, you know, you could be talking about a year. And so Sarver, as with anyone in a business situation like this, would have wanted to protect himself from any, you know, you're talking about a luxury tax payment. So if James Jones just gets crazy and all of a sudden he's making a, a trade for somebody you know, another max player, a Kevin Durant, for instance, and you're suddenly getting 50 more mil, uh, million more dollars on your luxury tax bill. Okay, I, I get why that protection would need to be there for even a suspended owner, even a persona non grata. This is still, you know, his asset officially. We can get into some of that in a second. I think the other part of this is it's still fair to keep in mind that Sarver is a controlling dude, right? I mean, we don't need to beat around the bush. He is a guy who liked to have his toy. He liked to run this thing with an iron fist and a nice shiny toy to show around. And he enjoys the power that comes with running a basketball team. And he didn't want to just give all of that away. I think there's probably an element of that, right? There's plenty of people who would have said, you know, if you're painting a, a utopian version of what this all could have gone gone like you would say okay I, I screwed up I'm gonna sell the team we'll do it as quickly as we can we'll find a good owner to take over this this community this franchise and uh whatever needs to happen between now and then Sam Garvin can make the final decision that'll be that you know and on that note I think the last part of this in terms of the why is we also can't forget the Suns could Right now, in January 2023, it's not insane to think of a, of a world in which the Suns were operate, would be operated by some combination of minority owners and the league office right now if Adam Silver had just done what a lot of people were calling for and banned Sarver for life or taken the Suns from him, removed him, held a vote with other team owners at least to potentially take the franchise from him. Then you don't have to worry about any sort of loopholes or any sort of agreements being put into place during the time of his suspension and the sale process because he wouldn't have any of that control to negotiate uh, with the league because he would have no control. Those are kind of what has led us to this, but what does it mean? Well, I think we don't fully know, um, but my biggest, the thing that matters the most to me is actually a quote that I haven't read yet, which is from Winhorst as well that this is, quote, a rare circumstance within the NBA having to negotiate trades without talking directly to the person who must approve it. We know if you've paid attention to sports for any amount of time, whether it's Robert Sarver's sons, Jerry Colangelo's sons, any other Arizona team, any other team across the whole world, owners are heavily involved in personnel. That's not debatable. It's a matter of how much, depending on the owner, and what ways that manifests itself for good or bad, but maybe you're not Jerry Jones. You're still at the end of the day, you run the company. If the company's making a big decision on a massive, important trade for the, the people who perform as the product, which is the playing of basketball, then of course you're going to have to be involved to some level. And so Jones having to try to fully negotiate a trade. If you imagine this situation right now, Jones is having to negotiate a trade without necessarily knowing he might have some idea, but he can't know for sure what Sarver would agree agree with. He's unable to legally, because of the suspension and everything else, communicate directly with Robert Sarver. But then when, the, when and if a trade did come together, Jones then has to present a finalized deal to Garvin, who then per, uh, presents it to Sarver. I think that's sort of the, 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 the chain of command. That is a very, very tough spot to be in. I mean, imagine trade deadline day, right? I just said that when Horse reported Ishbia won't be in place by the February 9th trade deadline, which maybe makes all of this completely uh, 
null and void. Maybe we should just assume it doesn't happen. But if we assume that there is still some wiggle room where Sarver would be open to certain trades, we just don't know which ones. And that chain of command is sort of sitting there still where Jones has to call ex-general manager, negotiate, talk to his team, call back that general manager. Okay, here's my counteroffer. All right, we have a deal. Then, okay, now I have to go to Sam Garvin, who has to then go to Robert Sarver. Okay, never mind. Sarver says no. Then it's back to Jones, who has to call back that other gen- Like That type of uh, pedantic, ridiculous communication chain is not going to work <laughs> on a, a day like trade deadline day in the NBA. How in the world would the Suns be able to be engaged with uh, the fast-flowing nature of a day like that? We're all glued to our phones watching it. We all know how crazy it can be. You can't have that many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, on a day like that. And that's all happening on a much smaller and slower scale as we make our way toward deadline day, but it's still there, and it really seems to be hamstringing James Jones. That's not me giving him a pass. That's not me you know, saying that he doesn't deserve any of the blame. He had an offseason heading into this year. Maybe we can agree he should have foreseen some of these limitations of the roster, etc. It doesn't, it's not really about that. It's more about as we are currently standing in this situation, as the Suns continue to drop these losses, this is creating a pretty big obstacle to improving the roster as things stand. So with that said, we've been talking a lot about expectations on the show, but this is a major new piece of information on top of Devin Booker's injury, on top of the struggles of this roster what does this mean for expectations for the rest of the season? If Ishby is not going to be in place before the deadline and Sarver has final say over anything that happens between now and when Ishbia takes over, where does that leave us? I don't think it's in as bad of a place as you might think, but we'll talk about that all after one more quick break. Five bottom lines, we'll call it, all right? There's usually maybe only one bottom line. In this case, maybe it's like a bottom... What's a five-sided shape? Are there any? I don't know. Bottom lines, quantity five. Now that we know more about the uh, semantics and logistics of this current Suns leadership structure, we can add that to the fact that the team was already going to be struggling to stay afloat minus Booker for this month, and we don't know when Cam Johnson will be back. We don't, obviously, the Crowder thing is looped into all of that. I think the the first bottom line is if the Suns can't make a bigger trade prior to the deadline, we can just rule out a deep playoff run for this team. Okay? And what I mean by a bigger trade is something like what we've heard in terms of reported packages with Crowder. So think about the... Um, you know, a three-team deal with Kuzma, Crowder, and John Collins as the centerpieces, right? I've talked about that in the past. Um, that, that doesn't seem possible. If, if that's not possible, then it doesn't seem like the Suns can really do much. Okay. But that of course would expand to include even bigger trades than that. Aiton, Cam Johnson, Chris Paul, Mikhail Bridges, any of the guys between Booker and Crowder in the pecking order getting traded is probably even less likely. I think if the Suns can do any trade, it's going to have to be a Crowder trade. But if they can't get a bigger Crowder trade, if they end up having to, let's say they do get one done, but it's something small like Grayson Allen or uh, Justin Holiday on the Hawks or whatever, uh, I don't think a deep playoff run is going to be possible. I've said all along, I believed the Suns could still be contenders this year, but they had to nail that Crowder trade. This makes it a lot harder to imagine that. So, James Jones has his work cut out for him. Number two, uh, bottom line is, I think so long as Book comes back and is relatively healthy the rest of the season, a top six seed is still very much within reach. Avoiding the play-in is still very much within reach, right? So, I'm not talking about the bottom falling out, but again, somewhere between a contender and a play-in team, that's not a terrible place to be, and I think that's totally still an option. Number three, um, tanking, anything like that, to me, out of the question. 
All right, for a few reasons. You cannot waste the season of Booker's prime. Assuming that he comes back again, as I keep saying, relatively healthy the rest of the season, you're talking about a guy who was an MVP candidate who was holding this team together for his first couple months of the season when he was healthy, scoring 50 multiple times, you know, 40 regularly. You can't ask that guy to come back in the end of January and say, oh, sorry, ownership thing got a little weird. We're not really going to do much this year. You want to sit games. You want to, you know, roll out there with some backups in the starting lineup with you, whatever. No, not an option. You can't waste the potential last season of Chris Paul, like last real season of Chris Paul. He's still a productive NBA player. He is not a star anymore the way he's playing right now. But still, you can't. This might be the last season he's on the Phoenix Suns, not just because of how he's performed, but also because of how his contract looks. He's a player who... Uh, can be cut for about half of his salary gets eaten. If he if he were to be cut, he's only guaranteed for about $15 million next year if maybe Matt Ishby is fine with with gobbling that money up. And then you just cut Chris Paul or you, you stretch him and you use five seasons of his career, which we'll get into if it ever becomes a thing. But this might be the last one and you can't just... It just kind of would feel like doing him dirty. Yes, he's he's underperformed this year. Yes, he's older, but... He took a chance on coming here. He gave the franchise some of the best moments it's ever seen. You can't just say, screw you for the last 30 games. We're trying to get Wembenyama, right? I just don't. That's not how life works. It's not how competitive people work. It's not how businesses are run. Lastly, I just don't think the new owners would ever agree to that. Whether we can disagree on the Booker and Paul parts of it and how willing you might be if you're a Suns fan to waste any of that stuff like I'm talking about. You're telling me, you know, Matt and Justin Ishbia, who've been trying to buy a sports franchise for such a long time, who just came on, came upon incredible life-changing wealth, that they're going to use that wealth to buy an NBA team that's on the the cusp of championship contention the past couple of years and say, screw it, we'll get the French dude. Like, no, that's that's crazy talk. That is not what new owners do ever. The the Timberwolves had one mediocre to good season. And gave everything away to hire Tim Connolly and trade for Rudy Gobert and everything else. This is not how it works, okay? Takeaway number four, bottom line number four is a lot still rides on the Crowder deal and any other moves. Um, That hasn't changed, okay? There's just a lot more questions about whether those moves will happen, can happen, than there were earlier in the season, okay? Okay? And last but not least, the Suns are still in a crappy holding pattern for the next five weeks. So in maybe in some ways, this didn't change anything. We still know the state of affairs for this team. It didn't change what's ahead of them. It just created a whole lot more uncertainty around the next five weeks leading up to the trade deadline. And obviously beyond that, as the Suns determine what they're really kind of status and level is going to be come playoff time. Are they really going to be a team that people are thinking of as a finals choice? Or are they going to be a team that gets the sixth seed? They battle, book looks great, but they lose in five or six games in the first round because this is what the rest of the roster is. We don't know. We still don't know. This didn't really get us any closer to those answers. It's still going to be on James Jones. As much as that chain of command looks crappy and broken, That's the the hand he's been dealt. Unless he wants to throw away a season, he just has to deal with that. Try to make a trade with Crowder to improve this roster. Maybe you start to think about bigger trades if you feel like that's palatable. Maybe it's just not an option right now. Either way, you're not just tanking. You're not just breaking apart this team for the sake of it. Uh, And so the only choice is forward. That'll wrap us up. One more game this week. Cleveland, Donovan Mitchell, I'm already terrified. I am already prepared to turn the game off at halftime. No, you know I don't do that. I have to tell you guys what happened so you don't have to watch. But I will be back tonight to recap that. And then finally, I promise you, we have scheduled it. I am on his calendar. Aaron Edwards will be on the show to close out the week. So hit subscribe or follow Make Locked on Suns your first listen every day from this week until the end of time. In the meantime, go make Locked On Sports today your second listen to get caught up on everything else going on around the world of sports. That show's available on all podcast platforms, so check it out, and I will talk to you all on Thursday.